was one of the leaders that, that uh, over time, uh, society is not a born leader. Nobody's a born leader. They uh, are using pressure. It, uh, it, it, society pressures people into becoming what they are in these days. Uh, tonight is a unique effort, though, I want to say, to unite and recruit leaders that from across the country, from the communities in which they have emerged, in which they have, due to the catastrophic events in California recently, out of the ashes from the wildfires of Paradise and down in Boosley and others, a phoenix has risen out of those ashes. A new beginning and a new movement of leaders that are being manifested, uh, who have been servicing since, well, since the beginning of the time, but we really started noticing since these catastrophic events have happened from throughout the country, the leaders in our presence, and they're here tonight, are great. And I'm telling you, they're great. Uh, we'll take a go to the promises of a union when we go to the hall later on in the program. We're going to be the fusion of undestructible bond, what we're going to be doing. That's what we are, that's what we are going to become. We're going to become fused together as individuals that will stand out amongst the rest. We are the unification of the leaders, the great leaders that will unite their members together with the direction and the focus, the dedication and the purpose of whatever you're going to do. The, towards responsibility and to protect those who have no protection at all. You? They, they have none. Uh, these who are educated, well, the ones that are uneducated, we're going to educate. That's, that's part of the, the whole thing. Uh, people that aren't educated and tend to slide away from things. Well, we know what to do. We're leaders. We need to go out there and educate them how we need to be. Uh, to denounce the word unacceptable. We can't accept unacceptable anymore. That's, that's not going to happen. Uh, the circumstances that came out to light are in the need right now. We need to bring things out of the dark and into the light. Definitely. We know how important that we are. We know how important and we know the cost of freedom. Can I hear her say yeah? Yeah. All right. We do. Our union has gathered here tonight. We'll be recognized as those leaders for the poor people from across the country. Hi, I'm Raylan. Hi, Hi, wife. As I'm almost there. And I take that title of crime. I really do, because I really do care about the homes. I care a lot about them. I care about them. My goal in my life is just to really reach out and help and be a leader and help everybody that really needs it, because I was like, I, I've seen it too long, and my people have been being her way, way too long. Right now, I would like to introduce and welcome our pastor, Kevin Phillips. doing his thing. It is so great. He has opened my eyes to a whole different, a whole different happening about being in church. I have not been in church in a long time. I've to hear him talk. Let me tell you what, he just lights me up. So I know he's going to light me up. Well, welcome everyone to uh, St. John's Church here in Marysville. There's something that most people do not know. And that is the Bible begins with the story of homeless people becoming empowered. Yes. Not only were they homeless people, they were slaves who were escaping slavery. They escaped slavery in Egypt. They raced across the wilderness without food, without water, without homes. And they went to a mountain where God met them. On that mountain, God spoke to each and every heart. And this is what the Lord said to each one of these former slaves, to each one of these homeless people. He said, If you will hearken to my voice and keep my covenant, you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's the foundation of everything. The Lord did not 
say to these former slaves, these homeless people, he did not say, once you get a job, you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He did not say, once you get a savings account and invest in the stock market, you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He did not say, he did not say, once you, once you buy a home and start paying property taxes and start paying income taxes, then you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That is not what the Lord said. Yeah. And the reason is, because having a job, having money, having your name on the deed of a home is meaningless if you do not listen to the voice of the Lord speaking deeply in your heart and if you do not keep covenant with the Lord and with your neighbor. And this is what the California Homeless Union is all about. Yeah. yeah. It's people coming together to listen very carefully to that word that is spoken in the deep places of your heart. That word that says you are a person of dignity. That word that says you have personal power. That word that says if you will unite together and keep faith with one another and listen to that voice that acknowledges and recognizes your dignity, then you will become a kingdom of priests that changes the world. That's the vision of the California Homeless Union. And my hope for each one of you is that you will hear that voice speaking in your heart. And not wait till you have a job. And not wait till you have money. And not wait until you have a deed on your house. But that you will start tonight to come together and begin to make a difference. Not only in your own life, but in the life of your neighbor. That's what tonight is all about. And I'm so grateful that you're here to make a good start. Can you pray with me? Let us pray. Gracious living God, you speak to us on the mountain. You see deeply in, into each of our hearts. You know the person that you created us to be. You put your eternal dignity inside each one of us. Help us to see that in ourselves. Help us to see that in one another. And as we hearken to your voice, and as we keep your covenant, Lord, we ask you that you help us rise. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
it wasn't that powerful. Okay, uh, for our next speaker, uh, our next speaker is, well, this guy, he found, he found his spot. Uh, I don't know if I call him an engineer or chief, but he found it. He just told you about it. Could you please give a warm welcome to Mr. Chris Schaefer? <laughs> And 
and today I feel very blessed. Thank you all very much. We're going to take 
if they get it. They're going to get threatened. Don't stop. Don't worry. Because we're going to inherit bigger and better. And if they, you, and the rest of them see it, you have nothing to fear at all.
which is another reason why you should register to vote, because you can put in even a little description of where you're at, and then every time the city comes and pushes you out, then you re-register to vote. And what you're doing is you're telling the feds how much the city and the county is picking on you. Mm. And that's, that's really what you need is a paper trail of data that the feds are going to have to own up to. Because what I'm actually driving is to sign everybody up for services. Because we've got about oh, at least 17, 1800, and we're about to do a point in time count right now. We've got a whole set of people, and I'm, I'm asking the county, I'm asking the cities, I'm asking the service providers, why don't we go and do that field work of connecting people, go door to door, tent to tent, person to person, and sign them up for services, at least everyone who would like to. Okay, because then we can separate the harmless from the homeless, the ones we would prefer to demonize. If there's some real god reason, because all it really comes down to is open discrimination. And that's what's really most frustrating about it. People are people, and it seems like kids, I, I do teaching, so I've seen kids in preschool all the way up, kids who are two act like they're 10, kids who are 10, I've seen act like they're 50, and then people who are 70 act like they're two. So it's, it's not about growing older, it's about growing up. And that's, that's really the redirection of the behavior of those kind of things. If we legitimize people, maybe housing first can just be a piece of dirt, but already I just stop molesting them stealing everything they have, you know, because people in the community, they're so generous and they'll give and they'll give and, and I've, I've given away and donated plenty of stuff and it all gets in the dumpster because the city just, that's how they spend their budget and it's like all that, you could have helped people instead of hurting them and that's what's just so hard to you just twist a knife and it's like, they're people and you're a public servant and do you even care? Why do you lie? I'm going to catch you in those lies, which is exactly why I video. Yeah. I video everything. I tell you, you need any encampment needs at least one to three people videoing, strength in numbers. You've got a solid witness that, that there's no way the court can refute. You, you just kind of deny access, you know, assert your rights, but don't be you know, combative. But, you know, you, you go through the motions and they steal your stuff, and now you got evidence. That's what I need is evidence. I need to take these people to court. I need to show how much they say one thing, but they do the opposite. And they do it with extreme prejudice. That's what bothers me is, you know, just because you got a badge and a gun, don't make it right. you got to be, a, a, you know, a, upholding the law. If you're going to enforce the law, you have to understand it. You have to uh, use discretion. And then I don't think that happens often enough. And I'll tell you what, man, this camera changes everything. It will make you equal. Okay? Um, don't even worry if you're high. I mean, you know, that's that's beside the point. Protect your rights. You've got rights. Either way, even if you're under the influence, whatever they think they're gonna be able to make a case against you, video. Because you stand up for yourself. I mean, there's this yellow vest movement out in France, man. And, and it's, it's this whole group of people just rising up and saying, no more. No more. And that's like, we got yellow, um, you know, second generation. You guys got yellow shirts? I said, I got a white one. Uh, but, you know, it's a, it's a yellow shirt. And we can do this. Really, we got it. Solidarity is all in it. It's, and I'm just totally pumped, dude, that, that uh, organize, organize, organize. <laughs> Right outside of Friendship Park. And 
But one thing I want to say about being homeless, it's no fun and everybody knows it. But the bottom line is, the problem is that nobody seems to care that I can do something about it. And um, I never forget, during the time period when um, President Reagan was shot by John Hinckley, I was homeless during that time period, me and my, I think my son must have been about two years old, three years old, and they had taken my other kid from me because I couldn't, because they said I couldn't take care of him. But anyway, um, you know, living in a car, I don't know what's better, living in a car, living in a tent, living by the river or wherever. But um, I have found working with the Sacramento Homeless Organizing Committee very, um, it's a very good outreach tool, and I'm sure just like your organization here it is, is looking after the, 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 the items that we have. When they have their tents, when, when people give them nice comforters, nice blankets, and they give them things. And when I see people giving away all these nice things to the homeless, I, you know, I, 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 my heart just goes out to some of the people because they don't know that maybe within a couple of days that stuff is going to end up in the dumpster. You know, give away sleeping bags and all that. So, one thing I really like about what was said up here up, uh, by Wes about voting it is so important. And I'm so glad that one of the things that Shock did was they took on a voting, we just did a voting registration drive right there at Lowe's and Fishes. And um, we're going to city council, and I'm sure y'all do all that stuff too. And But one thing I want to say about this Newsom, this government, governor that we have, you know, he came out to uh, the stables on his campaign uh, literature saying that he was going to create 425,000 new housing in this eight year. This is the stuff they were mailing out for us to vote for. But in yesterday's paper, it said that uh, he was going to be shooting for 378000 So he's lying already. So the bottom line is, we need to really, you know, be on top of, of voting. And we all need to be involved in keeping the dream alive. The dream, what? Of everybody's got a right to live in decent, and affordable housing, and we need to work together. We have two newspapers in our region that we can write for. I know you see the submit pictures too. One of the papers is uh, the homework that Shock puts out, and the People's Tribune and the, and the People's Tribunal. It's, and um, one thing that we need to do is to remember what Richard said. He started something. He came up here. Where Richard's at? Richard says we got to organize. We have to organize. We have to organize. And if we don't organize and stay on top of what these lying politicians are talking about and the promises that they make, and we need to call them to the carpet when we see that they go offline. So I'm glad that we have a group that uh, is circling from California. What does the church say? Mm -hmm. California. Northern California. Yeah. And once we all come together, we're going to become stronger and stronger. So we can organize and organize. Thank you very much. Wow.
fire. I was a dog groomer, still am. I have two children um, at my home, and I identify myself as a veteran, a survivor, a small business owner, and a mother. In the wake of a campfire, at about, it was four days ago, a friend called me and he told me that there were children out at Walmart that did not have oxygen masks on, and that there was nothing happening with the people that were out there. There was nobody helping them. But people were out feeding them, and they were giving them stuff. They were not organizing rides, they were not moving them to shelters, they were not informing them on safe places for them to reside in the wake of this. That was unacceptable to me. I <coughs> sat in my partner's arms and I sobbed, and I sobbed, and I sobbed at the thought of this happening about, you know, less than a mile away the road flies from my home. And it kept me awake, and at about 1.30 in the morning I went and I drove to the Walmart parking lot because I needed to see for myself. And if people were willing to just take a moment to meet the people that are struggling with homelessness and to care enough to just go look, go say hi, give someone a hug, we would experience a significant change in this community, in society, and across the planet. When I was out there, I found that many of these people had very sim simple issues to resolve in order to move them out of this tent city. So I started going tent to tent. And I said, what is it that you need in order to get you out of this situation? And the answer for most of the people that I, that I met at the beginning, they needed a tank of gas. <laughs> they had been sitting out there for days in the most toxic air on the planet because they needed $30 in gas to get them to family. And then I moved to the next group. And what did they need? They, their cars had broken down because, you know, they're, they're sleeping in a tent after a disaster. So we got the cannons out there, and my friends were out there with their headlamps on wrenching. And these are people that are responding, just on a Facebook blast. Hey, I need this. Not a problem. There they are. They show up. And then I started realizing I have a talent at combining poverty with help. So it continued. And from that point on, I, um, I, I most of the people have been, been moved out that, that had homes prior to the fire. And after they were moved out, I started meeting people that were pre-fire homeless. And instead of asking them, what do you need in order to get out of this situation, I started asking, what is it that you need to be happy? And I'll tell you what, that response blew me away because the first person that I asked said, I want a 12 by 12 space and to be left alone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, 
And the solution is outside the box, and it's not just a shelter. It's a, an opportunity to heal, not just the human. It starts with the individual. The healing has to begin with the individual, but this plan would effectively heal humans all the way to the community, across, across the, and, and, and heal the earth. And at this point in time, I think that we do not have any other option but to look at the fact that we have been asleep as a society. It is time to heal. We have been wounded, and there is no excuse for this to continue. So I'm here for you. I can walk between the worlds. I can go to the lowest low and the highest high, and everywhere in between. And, well, I would show you, but over half my body is covered in a phoenix tattoo from my own struggles. So. I, you know, every day I, I come across something, and yeah, it's kind of like a long about But I have a ritual myself. Now, some people make a ritual. They think about like ugly old great witches making up some kind of blue rock or cat pie or something. <laughs> Making some poison to the princess, right? Well, that's not what I look at, parents. A ritual to me is a, is a simple word describing a series of actions. Actions are strong. You have to have a series of value, as I see it, uh, beyond the particular and implications, situations. But a ritual is just like, for an example, uh, drinking a cup of coffee in the morning. You know, you go to a certain place in the house, you got a certain cup, you want to drink your coffee out of it. So you drink it. That's a ritual. Everybody drinks coffee or maybe tea. Um, but to me, my ritual and my intention every day that I can't wake up, and I wake up, and I, I look around, I look around my room, I look at Brian, and I kind of look out the window, I think of my brother going to work, that's his ritual, and he works hard. He doesn't start staying at his house after the, or the flood of the jungle, call it. There was 15 people that were stranded on an island, and um, I made a phone call, and I told the chief of police, I said, look, when was the last time you were at the jungle? I got 15 people that stranded on an island down there and can't get off. I said, what are you going to do? you got to go rescue these people. I can't swim out there. They can't swim down the bay. And it was pretty sad. Those were my friends, my family. And I really felt bad. But what I'm really trying to say is I go camp to camp about every other day. I go camp to camp and I see what the needs are of all the homes in my town. I've been here, I've been homeless for 13 years. And you know, between my time in and out of prison, and I don't have a good rap sheet, but as I walk, I take walks with the people every day. And sometimes when I take that walk, I'll grab a rock at the beginning of my walk. And I know my destination because I know where I'm going beforehand. And when I get to where I'm going, I would drop that rock. That's my whole intention. That rock keeps my solid. When I drop that rock, I know my destination has ended. And I feel that if I stay strong with myself and with my people, as I call the homeless, I can make those goals every day just by carrying that rock and dropping it. That's the beginning and the end of my whole intention. My intention is to help every homeless person I possibly can. I go out of my way sometimes to help them. I, uh, I kind of get like a wave. I give them more than I do for myself. <coughs> that's okay, because that's my calling. And I really feel that that is my calling. And I will continue to do that. And since I've joined the Poor People's Campaign and we formed a homeless community, my eyes have opened up so much. When I went to Washington, D.C. and I first met Liz, it was so awesome. I was on this stage, there's 50,000 people out in front of me, and I go, can I do this? And I'm looking at Brian, and I look back, and I see Liz. And it was the look in her eyes and her face that told me I could do it. She didn't have to say a word to me. I would like to introduce you to Dr.
Dr. or Reverend Dr. Liz Gaines. things 
ought to be, how things would be if we followed God's will. And it's about the poor and the homeless being blessed. And it's about those who hunger for righteousness being filled. And those who mourn organizing and being comforted. And then Matthew 6 teaches us a prayer that Jesus wants us to pray. And we said the Lord's Prayer in Paradise this morning. And that prayer is about how life here on earth can be beautiful and full. And that everybody could have our needs met. And then Matthew 7 says that we're supposed to do unto others what we would want them to do unto us. So the Bible's pretty clear about how we treat each other, how we treat us poor people, is how we treat God and what God wants from us. And then we get to Matthew 8. And Matthew 8 starts with the story of a, a sick person, a marginalized leper who has been rejected by society, who comes to Jesus and says, if you choose, you can heal me. If you choose, I can be made well. So Jesus responds, I do choose, and heals him. And then continues to gather more people around him. More people that want to join this movement that Jesus is trying to organize. Folks are, are saying, can I come along? Can I join? And Jesus thinks it's really important then to say who he is and where he comes from. And he says this passage, foxes have dens and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man doesn't have anywhere to lay his head. Now, I'm kind of skeptical of lots of biblical scholars, but there's a few that I like. And one that I really like says that actually how we should read that line is that foxes have dens and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man, Jesus, is homeless. And then he kind of keeps on going and says, actually, we should read this passage even a little bit more collectively. Not only about Jesus. And it should be that foxes have dens, and birds of the air have their nests, but humans are the only ones who are homeless. And then the story continues, and it's about people joining a movement of poor and homeless folks to turn over the tables of society and, and make life good for everybody. So I, I, I start with the Bible because I think for too long many of us have been blamed for our poverty. Many of us have been called lazy, crazy and stupid. We've been bombarded with messages that if God wanted to end homelessness, he would do so. We've been lied to and told that if we just prayed more or worked harder or had fewer babies or did less drugs, we wouldn't have to suffer so much. But as someone who loves the Bible and studies the Bible and then tries to bring that Bible into our world today, we need to know that the Bible actually has a very different message. That Jesus reminds us that even if we don't have housing, 
or adequate food. Even if our kids go to schools that are failing. Even if we work way too hard for way too little. It doesn't have to be this way. It's not what God wants. It's not God's will. And he reminds us that it's our responsibility to our community, to our country, and to God to build a movement that can end poverty and end homelessness. And Jesus reminds these followers, the same ones who are experiencing poverty and homelessness just like him, that we're supposed to let our light shine. We're not supposed to hide it under a bushel. We're supposed to give our bodies and our minds and our souls to uplifting the human condition. And this idea that the way that you honor God, a creator, by protecting the vulnerable and loving your neighbor and taking care of each other isn't just an idea in Christianity. It's an idea that runs through all of the world's religions. And so, I, I came to a lot of this work because when we were organizing amongst the homeless in Philadelphia, we took over an abandoned church. And the priests of that church wanted to kick us out. And so some folks brought a poster and hung it up on the walls. And it said, why do we worship a homeless man on Sunday, but ignore one on Monday? And I have that poster still hanging up next to where I sleep. It's a reminder of what society is supposed to do in the face of poverty, in the face of racism, in the face of homelessness, in the face of the devastation of our communities. And who it is that can be those who change the world to make it the way it's supposed to be. forget this passage I referenced earlier where the sick person goes to Jesus and says, if you choose, you can heal me. Because indeed, if our society decided to end homelessness, it could. If our politicians decided to pay people living wages. They could. Poverty is not a necessity. It is a sin against God. And it's totally made up. We just don't have the will. We don't have the power. We don't have the organization. And so that is why as Richard says, we're going to organize, organize, organize. So indeed there is an emergency in this country. And it's getting worse. Here in 2019, there are 140 million people who are poor and low income. That's almost half of the U.S. population. More people die every year. 250,000 people die every year from poverty. That's more than who die from heart attacks and strokes and cancer combined. This winter, 700 homeless people will freeze to death. But we have enough housing to go around. 
And we live in a country where we pay 53 cents of every discretionary dollar for the military, for things like the police, to come and take our stuff away from us. Yeah. Yeah. But less than 15 cents on health care and education and anti-poverty programs and help. The priorities are all wrong. But it doesn't have to be this way. Because we're here on Martin Luther King Day. And he has a different message for us. He says, we are called upon to help the discouraged beggars in life's marketplace. But one day we must come to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. It means that questions must be raised. And you see, my friends, when you deal with this, you begin to ask the question, who owns the oil? You begin to ask the question, who owns the iron ore? You begin to ask the question, why is it that people have to pay water bills in a world that's two-thirds water? So, the only way we can honor Dr. King on his 90th birthday, 50 years after he was killed for trying to unite poor people across race, across geography, into a powerful poor people's campaign, is to take up the baton and carry it the next mile. It's the only way. So if we're not doing that work of trying to organize and unite poor people all over this country, we're not truly honoring King. And we can't just take up the quick work, but we have to ask the questions that King was asking. I was in Michigan last week with more witnesses from the Poor People's Campaign who were arrested during the 40 days. Arrested for trying to shut down the Department of Environmental Quality, the same department that was in charge of overseeing the poisoning of the people of Flint. The same department that was overseeing the hundreds of thousands of people whose water has been shut off in Detroit, who've lost their homes and become homeless, and their kids have been taken away because they don't have a home, because they don't have water. This question, if we live in a world that's two-thirds oil, a two-thirds water, why do we have to pay these water bills? I think it's pretty relevant still for us today. Or driving around paradise, talking about the problem of climate change. Do you know that $20 billion are given to the fossil fuel industry? But have we seen almost any help for folks? that are victims of climate change and disasters caused by climate change. We've got to ask these questions. Who owns this? So that we can figure out what are we going to be able to do to organize ourselves out of this situation. And I bet you all here, just like I do, have a bunch of questions on our own selves. I mean, a question I have is, why do we have so many poor people in this very rich society? Why do we have to fight over crumbs when there's more than enough to go around? I often ask this question to myself, when is this suffering going to end? Because as we start to ask those questions, we begin to shift the narrative and shift the narrator. We start to talk about the real issues of our day. We begin to defeat the lies that we should blame immigrants or the homeless 
or the victims of storms, or those that were poor before the storms even hit. And instead, we can start seeing that when the poor take action together, we can build a movement that can change life for the better for everyone. And I see people here in Northern California beginning to come together. And Dr. King had a lot to say about this coming together as well. I think you probably are aware, but this divide and conquer tactic isn't that new. They're not just doing it amongst the fire victims and those that were homeless in Chico over the last couple of months. And Dr. King has a very powerful thing to say about this. He said this the night before he was killed, when he was in Memphis with striking sanitation workers, trying to build the Poor People's Campaign. He said, you know, whenever Pharaoh wanted to prolong the period of slavery in Egypt, he had a favorite, favorite formula for doing it. And what was that? He kept the slaves fighting among themselves. But whenever the slaves get together, something happens in Pharaoh's court. And he cannot hold the slaves in slavery. When the slaves get together, that's the beginning of getting out of slavery. So as we were traveling today around Northern California, around Chico and Paradise and here in Marysville, and as we met with people who are coming together and organizing, I'm here to say that something's happening in Pharaoh's court. Maybe it's the Maryville County Court. Maybe it's about some of the other courts we're all fighting in. But this idea that the beginning of getting out of poverty is when people begin to come together. That's a powerful idea. And a powerful idea, when put into practice, like you all are putting it into practice, has the power to change everything. So, in this sanctuary this evening, I see people that engaged in the largest wave of nonviolent civil disobedience in the 21st century. Folks that stepped forward to be a part of the Poor People's Campaign and engaged in nonviolent civil disobedience and organizing and mobilizing and educating. And many of us that were arrested during the nonviolent civil disobedience of the 40 days didn't get arrested because we thought another arrest was a good idea. I myself have been arrested enough for other kinds of things. We engaged in this direct action because there comes a time when we are compelled to change unjust laws. When I organized in the homeless union about 20 years ago, we would go to different towns and cities where people were organizing other homeless unions, and where people were being evicted from their homes, people being pushed out of their tents. And we had this idea that if we stayed in the home that we were being evicted from, we were illegal, but we lived. If we got evicted and filed that eviction notice, we were legal, but many of us started to die. It raises the question of unjust laws and what you do in the face of injustice to challenge those laws. So I want to finish with one more quote from Dr. King. He says, 
There comes a time when a moral man can't obey a law which his conscience tells him is unjust. And I tell you this morning, my friends, that history has moved on and great moments have often come forth because there were those individuals in every age, in every generation, who were willing to say, I will be obedient to a higher law. These men were saying, I must be disobedient to a king, to be order to be obedient to the king. Never forget that everything that Hitler did in Germany was legal. It was legal to do everything that Hitler did to the Jews. It was a law in Germany that Hitler issued himself that it was wrong and illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. But I tell you, if I had lived in Hitler's Germany with my attitude, I would have openly broken that law. I would have practiced civil disobedience. And so it is important to see that there are times when a man-made law is out of harmony with the moral law of the universe. There are times when human law is out of harmony with eternal and divine laws. And when that happens, you have an obligation to break it. And that I'm happy that in breaking it, I have some good company. I have Shadrach and Meshach and Abnego, I have Jesus and Socrates, and I have all of the early Christians who refused to buy. So, I think this is pretty true today. So what I want to do for a minute is to recognize those of you, especially from the Homeless Union, from the California Poor People's Campaign, who have stepped forward and said that you refuse to bow. You refuse to bow to unjust anti-homeless laws and practices. You refuse to bow to the unjust closure of emergency shelters. You refuse to bow to leaders who are trying to divide us racism and xenophobia and classism. You refuse to bow to the injustice of poverty and homelessness. We know from history, we know from today, that somebody is hurting our brother, somebody is hurting our sister, somebody is poisoning our water, somebody is letting our communities burn, somebody is making us homeless. And we've been silent for far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. We had a saying and a slogan when I was a part of the Homeless Union that was, you only get what you're organized to take. You only get what you're organized to take. And that's about taking back our dignity and our humanity. It's about taking back our housing and the resources that are ours. And it's about refusing to be silent in the face of evil and injustice refusing to be divided from people who all need a better life. The only way we can honor Dr. King is if we decide to step up and stand up and not bow to injustice, live into a higher law, and say, we can when we can organize, we can mobilize, we can build the biggest movement this town, this state, 
this country has ever seen. Led by those who are most impacted. Because in the words of Frederick Douglass, only those of us in pain know when our pain is relieved. And we can band together with people from all walks of life. Clergy and activists and advocates and folks that are morally injured by the poverty and homelessness in our society. And we can bring about a moral revival in this land. I'm very heartened to see what people are doing in this part of the country. And just like I will read Raylan's testimony to many communities that I will travel to this next week and two weeks and three weeks, we're going to tell the story of the resurrection that's happening in Paradise, in Chico, in Maryville, in California, where people are coming together. And out of our bruised and battered bodies, building something that is beautiful and life-giving and what God wants. For all of us. People have done it before. We can do it even better. Thank God for the Homeless Union. Thank God for all of you who have stepped forward to say, we're not going to bow to injustice. And so we've expanded our union, and you know, I have a kid, I just go, just stop with this. 
Uh, I have a son now who's 16 years old, and that guy is taller than me, he's bigger than me, I can't tell him what to do anymore, you guys know what that's like if you have teenage children, but I remember when he first came out, and he was just a little thing, just a little thing, so right now we, we're still a little thing, and I think as Richard said, organize, 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 we have our work cut out for us, this is a serious fight, nobody's going to cut us any slack, we're walking point for the whole broad movement of poor people, and our adversaries know that they want to cut off those who are walking point. Because we don't just represent the homeless, we represent the 140 million poor people in this country. Right? Am I right about that? So, so, right now, we were in the incubator for the last few years, but I think we're out of the incubator. We're out of the incubator as homeless youth. And we're walking, and we're falling down a little bit. And the only way a kid learns how to walk is to fall and pick themselves up and learn from how they fell down. Am I right about that? Yeah. Yeah. So we're making our mistakes, we're learning from them, we're reaching out, we're taking it one step at a time, we're meeting outstanding leaders. I find it just emblematic of where we're at. A guy like Richard Munzer, a carpenter who has spent his entire life building homes, his entire life building structures, his entire life creating habitation for people in the city of Chico, is homeless. And I think it's an irony and it's a great testament to what we're building here that he has risen and has become one of the leaders in the homeless union movement in Chico. <coughs> Just as we had a carpenter that Liz was talking about. I'm not making a comparison to the fact that we have that, uh, we'll have some little more discussion later. But Dr. Martin Luther King said, you know, we, we see a lot of we see a lot of uh, dark clouds, we have a lot of difficulty. We know homeless people are suffering and dying tonight uh, as, as we stand here. And so uh, let's remember what Dr. King said. Only in the darkness can you see the stars. Only in the darkness can you see the stars. I look out at this audience tonight, the people we met in Chico earlier today, the people in Paradise, the people on the river bottoms here in Marysville, I see the whole galaxy, not just some stars in the whole galaxy. So, Dad, so thanks so much, and let's go get some to eat. All right? Did you have to pray for that holy meal? Yes. One more thing. I am so honored to be here with you all tonight. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, what an amazing evening, what an incredible day. On this day of Martin Luther King, may we be able to come together even greater in the community and break bread and continue our conversations, not on just this day, but in many, many, many years to come. And may we make a difference in this place, in this moment, in this time and place. And as scripture says, for such a time as this, we pray all of this in your name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.